to summarize what we learned last time, the inertial frames of two observers, for example, Alice and Bob, who are moving at constant speed relative to each other, are related by a Lorentz transformation. This transformation guarantees that the speed of light remains constant for both observers, but in the process, we find that each observer has a different notion of space and time. Now, just to be clear, there is just one space-time. So there's this one background where all the observers are. But every observer sees this space-time from a different perspective and arranges their own personal space and time axes in different directions. So it's kind of like, um, if I look at this desk over here, from this perspective, or from this perspective, or from this perspective, basically each student in the class sees this desk from a different perspective, and they see that different sides of the desk in their perspective have different length. Our eyes know how to correct for the perspective, but if you just view this as a two-dimensional image, then each side of the desk will look different length to different students in the class. Now, the same happens with this Lorentz transformation. Two observers are moving at some relative speed relative to each other, and they both see the same space-time, just like all the students here are seeing the same desk, but this space-time has a space direction and a time direction, just like this desk has a uh, width and a depth. And different observers will see the directions of time and space differently, even though they're both seeing the same space-time. Now this Lorentz transformation and the fact that different observers see space and time differently uh, turns out to have some weird consequences, which we will now discuss. However, these weird consequences only become significant at relativistic speeds, when the relative speed between the two observers is close to the speed of light. This is why we don't notice them in our daily lives, because we usually move at extremely slow speeds compared to light. Just as an example, a car can move at, let's say, around 120 kilometers per hour. Um, this is 33 meters per second, but that's nothing compared to light, which moves at 1 billion kilometers per hour, or 300 million meters per second. Okay, so if you had a car that could go close to a billion kilometers per hour, then you might start experiencing these relativistic effects that I'm going to talk about. But if you're just moving at normal speeds of, let's say, maybe even the fastest plane that we have can only move at a few hundred kilometers per hour, maybe a thousand kilometers per hour, that's the maximum speed that you can really achieve in real life. That's nothing compared to one billion kilometers per hour. Okay, so the first consequence I'm going to talk about is relativity of simultaneity. So let's consider two events. For example, lights turning on in two different places. Okay, so imagine that I have just, I don't know, like two light bulbs, one here, one there, like on each side of the desk, and I turn these lights, there's like a switch, I press the switch, and it turns both lights on. Now, it seems obvious to us that anyone who sees the events, for example, sees the two lights turn on, 
agrees on whether they happen at the same time, so simultaneously or not. However, as it turns out, two observers, uh, when two observers are moving at relativistic speeds, so speeds that are close to the speed of light or a significant fraction of the speed of light, that is not the case. They will not agree on whether the two events happen simultaneously. Now, I'm not going to just claim this, I'm going to actually prove it. So, we have here, like we had last time, we have Alice and Bob. So, both of them, like I said before, they see the space, the, the same space-time, but they have different space and time axes. So, this is what we call a space-time diagram. The space axis is X, that's the horizontal axis. The time axis is T, that is the vertical axis. And now, just like last time, I draw these green and blue lines. So the green lines are lines of uh, basically any point on the line is at the same place. So like this is x equals 1, right? So all the points on this line are located at x equals 1. And the blue lines, similarly, are lines of constant time. So any point on the blue line is at the same point in time according to Alice. So like every point here is at t equals 2. Now this is the, how Alice views space-time. But now we do this Lorentz transformation, and this is how Bob views space-time. So remember that in the Lorentz transformation, the time and space axis rotate toward each other, so space kind of gets squished. And now Bob sees the space axis go like this and the time axis go like this, and he calls them x prime and t prime. And again, we have these lines of constant space, like constant position and constant time. So the green lines are the lines of constant position, according to Bob. So for example, if this is x equals 1, according to Bob, all the points on this green line are all at x prime equals to 1. And this is x prime equals 2. So all the points along this green line are at x prime equals 2. The blue lines are the lines of constant time, according to Bob. So this is t prime equal 1. So this is where Bob, if he looks at his watch, he sees that one second has passed. So this is this blue line. All the points along this blue line are at t prime equals 1. So according to Bob, all the points along this line are happening at the same time. Now again, I just want to stress that this is a space-time diagram. So, you shouldn't view this as space. It's not like a two-dimensional space and there's things at different places in space. Space is just the horizontal axis, or I guess in this case, the kind of diagonal axis over here, or over here. This is space. And as we go up, as we go vertically in the diagram, we just move to different times. So, okay, now what's happening here? So I have two events that I marked here in red. Okay, we call these events because they happen at a certain place at a certain time. This event for Alice happens at x equals zero and t equals 4, and this event for Alice happens at x equals 4 and t equals 4. Okay, so the two events in red happen at the same time for Alice. Both of them happen at t equals 4 seconds. You can see that this is t equals 4, this blue line is the line of constant time, any point on this line is t equals 4, and both points are on this line, so both points happen at the same time, according to Alice. However, 
for Bob, okay, we do this Lorentz transformation. Remember, the Lorentz transformation is if I want to see how someone else who is moving at some constant relative speed, I want to see how they see space-time. So Bob is moving at a certain speed. In fact, in this case, the speed Bob moves is 60% of the speed of light. And therefore, his space-time gets squished compared to Alice's. But again, in both cases, it's the same space-time. It's just different perspective. So Bob has a different perspective on space-time. This is how he sees it. And for Bob, the event on the right happens first. And the event on the left happens second. Because you can see the event on the right is happening at time t prime equals 2. So this is t prime equals 2. And this blue line is the line of all the events that happen at time t prime equals 2 for Bob. And then the event on the left happens at t prime equals 5. So both observers see the same two events in the same space-time. You notice that these two points are at the same place in space-time. I didn't move the points. If I just took these two uh, these two graphs and put them on top of each other, the points, the two red points are going to be at exactly the same place. So I didn't move the points. The points are in space-time. They are just events that are happening. But Alice and Bob each sees them happening at different places at different times according to their personal view on space-time. Okay, so each, uh, both observers see the same two events in the same space-time, only the perspective of each observer has changed. Alice sees these two events as happening simultaneously, and Bob sees them as happening not simultaneously. According to Bob, this event happened first, and this event happens later. So this is what I mean by relativity of simultaneity. These two observers don't agree on whether the events happen at the same time or not. And again, you can imagine this as doing an actual experiment, and Alice puts the two light bulbs on each side of the desk, and she presses a button, and in her frame, pressing the button makes both light bulbs turn on at the same time. But then Bob is moving very, very fast past the desk, and he will actually see the light on the right turn first, and only then the light on the left. Now, the second consequence of special relativity is time dilation. Consider two events that happen at two different times. Now, again, it seems, it seems obvious to us that anyone who sees the events agrees on how much time passed between them. But when two observers are moving at relativistic speeds, that is not the case. So, for example, the time from the start of this lecture to the end of this lecture is uh, an hour and 20 minutes. That is what we see in our frame, but if someone is moving at 60% of the speed of light relative to us, they will see that time being dilated. They will see it as being longer than an hour and 20 minutes. So again, I'm not just going to claim it, I'm going to actually prove to you that this is indeed the case. So again, I have two events in red, and these two events happen four seconds apart for Alice. You can see the first event for Alice happens at t equals zero, and the second event happens at t equals four. So Alice looks at her watch and she counts Let's say these are, again, two lights turning on. Okay, so the first light turns on, Alice starts her stopwatch, and then 
after four seconds on Alice's stopwatch, she sees the second light turn on. However, for Bob, the two events actually happen five seconds apart. So again, you'll notice that the space-time positions of these two events hasn't changed. If I move these graphs on top of each other, the red dots are going to be in the same place. It's just that Bob defines space and time differently. So according to Bob, between the first event and the second event, five seconds have passed because the first event happened at t, equals, at t prime equals zero, and that Bob started his stopwatch and he measured one, two, three, four, five seconds on his stopwatch between the two events, let's say between the two lights turning on. So in other words, Bob sees time dilated from four seconds to five seconds. Now, if both events are located at the same place, the time difference between them is called proper time. And proper time is always the shortest time between the events. So Alice is measuring proper time because you can look at Alice's grid and you can see that both events are happening at the same place for her. So for Alice, this is x equals zero and both events happen at x equals zero. So Alice is measuring proper time. However, Bob is not measuring proper time because the events are happening at different places for him. So again, the green lines are lines of constant position. The points along a green line are all at the same place, but this point is at this place, this is x prime equals zero, and this point, this event, is actually on a different green line. This is actually x prime equals, so this is minus one, minus two, minus three. So these two events for Bob happen at different places, therefore he is not measuring proper time. And we can see that indeed the proper time as Alice measures is the shorter time. If Alice measures proper time, she measures the shorter time, which is four seconds. Bob is not measuring proper time, so he will measure five seconds. Now the ratio of dilated to proper time is called the Lorentz factor, and it's denoted by the Greek letter gamma, which looks like this. Now in our example, Alice measures a proper time of four seconds, and Bob measures a dilated time of five seconds, so the Lorentz factor is five divided by four, which is 1.25 one and a quarter. Essentially, time gets dilated by 25%. The Lorentz factor increases as the relative speed increases. The precise relation between the Lorentz factor and the relative speed is that gamma, the Lorentz factor, is equal to one over square root of one minus beta squared where beta is the ratio of the relative speed between the observers to the speed of light. So like in our example, I said that Bob is moving at 60% um, of the speed of light. So in our example, we have gamma equals 1.25, so the tire has been dilated by 25%, and if you uh, invert this relation, you find this corresponds to beta equals 0 0.6. So the ratio or rel the relative speed to the speed of light is 0 0.6, therefore the relative speed is 60% of the speed of light. But don't worry, you won't need to know this precise relation for the test. I know this is uh, kind of a complicated equation. All you need to know is that the Lorentz factor increases. So the larger 
I mean, the faster the relative speed is between the two observers, the more significant the time dilation will be. And of course, if the speed is very slow, then the time dilation factor will be extremely small. If you move it 10 kilometers per hour, then gamma is probably going to be something like 1.0000000000001 or something like that. And then you will never know this that effect in real life. But if you move it to relativistic speeds, then gamma is going to be different than one. Okay, the third consequence of special relativity is length contraction. So notice this is basically the opposite of time dilation. Time gets dilated, but length gets contracted. Consider an object, for example, a desk at rest in Alice's frame. So again, you can imagine this desk and Alice is standing next to the desk and she's not moving anywhere. So the desk is at rest in Alice's frame. If the relative speed between Alice and Bob is relativistic, if it's close to the speed of light, then Alice and Bob will not agree on the length of the object. So again, I'm going to prove this to you. So in Alice's frame, the object is at rest, so it stays in the same place at all times. Therefore, you can represent the object as a rectangle. Okay, this is the desk, because this is the desk at time zero, and this is the desk at time one, and this is the desk at time two. The desk just stays in the same place at all times. So if we just look at the path the desk takes in space-time, it will be a rectangle. Now Alice measures the length of the object to be five. We can see here, I measure from left to right, there's a total of five. Units. If you remember, the units we're using here are light seconds for length, but it doesn't really matter. Its point is that this is five length units. And in Bob's frame, the object is moving, because Bob is moving relative to Alice. So if the desk is at rest for Alice, then the desk is going to be moving for Bob. So Bob can only measure the length of the object if he freezes it in time, that is along a blue line or the x prime axis. Okay, remember the blue lines are the lines of constant time. And I can't measure the length of an object if it's moving. I have to take a snapshot. I can take my phone and take a photo of the object at a certain point in time, and then I can measure the length in that photo. So let's draw the object frozen in time in Bob's frame as a yellow line. Okay, so this, remember this red rectangle, that is where the object is in space-time. And this yellow line is now just a snapshot of the object at a particular point in time. This is at time t prime equals zero for Bob. So again, it takes a photo of the object. And if we count the number of green lines intersecting the yellow line, we find that Bob measures the length of the object as four. Okay, so this is the desk according to Bob. It stretches from here to here, and Bob measures length using these green lines. Okay, so he measures one, two, three, four. Okay, there's a distance of four between the left side of the desk and the right side of the desk, according to Bob, when he took this snapshot. So Bob sees the length as being contracted with the same Lorentz factor, which was 5 fourths or 1.25. Okay, so this is, like I said, this is the opposite of time dilation. In this case, Alice sees the length of the object as five, and Bob sees it as contracted to four. Now, the length of the object in frame where it is at rest, so 
in Alice's frame is called the proper length. And again, this is uh, analogous to proper time. Proper length is always the longest length of an object. And again, this is the opposite of proper time, which is always the shortest time. So proper length is always the longest length. Here, Alice is measuring the proper length of five, while Bob is measuring a contracted length of four. Remember, there is no such thing as absolute speed. Both observers are moving relative to each other, and it's important to understand that these effects are relative as well. Okay, that's why it's called relativity, because everything is relative. So if Alice measures a proper time of four in her frame, then Bob measures a dilated time of five for the same two events in his frame, as we saw. However, if we invert the situation, if Bob measures a proper time of four in his frame, then Alice measures a dilated time of five for the same two events in her frame. Okay, so there is a symmetry here. So no observer actually experiences time faster or slower than the other. Now, this is a common misconception. They just don't agree on proper versus dilated time. So of course, as usual, if you look up time dilation on YouTube, 99.999% of the videos are going to repeat this common misconception and tell you that Alice and Bob experience time faster or slower. That's what the YouTube videos are going to tell you, but that's a common misconception. Time is the same time. It's just that everyone has a different perspective on it. So they just don't agree on proper and dilated time. The proper time that you measure in your own frame is always going to be shorter than the dilated time someone else is going to measure in their frame. But if they measure their proper time, then your time is going to be dilated for the same two events they measured. So there's a symmetry here. There's no actual time moving faster or slower for one observer, but not for the other. Okay, so we see that there is a perfect symmetry between the observers. However, this only applies as long as both frames are inertial. Remember, an inertial frame is a frame that is not accelerating. If one of the observers is accelerating, then they are not in an inertial frame, and the symmetry is broken. So each observer can, in that case, actually experience different time durations. A famous example of this is the twin paradox. So in this paradox, Alice and Bob are twins. So presumably, they are the same age to begin with. Alice stays on Earth, while Bob travels at relativistic speeds on a spaceship to another planet, and then comes back. The question is now, when they meet again, which twin will be older? Because there has been time dilation, so maybe one of them will be older than the other. OK, so let's assume that the Lorentz factor is 1.25, like before. Again, that corresponds to a speed of 60% of the speed of light. Let's also assume that the total distance of Bob's trip is six light years. So he travels three light years in one direction and then comes back three light years. The total trip is six light years. Then trip takes uh, at a speed of 60% of the speed of light, it will take 10 years according to Alice. Okay, I just divide the length of the trip by the speed to get the duration of the, the trip. Alice knows that Bob will experience time dilation, so correcting for that, she predicts that the trip will only take 10 divided by 1.25, or eight years according to Bob. Therefore, 
Alice predicts that when the, twin, when the twins meet again, she will be older than Bob. So the paradox is that from Bob's perspective, he is at rest in his spaceship, and Alice is the one that is moving, because planet Earth moves away from Bob and then back toward him. Okay, so if, if I'm Alice, then I stay at rest on Earth, and I see Bob moving away in his spaceship and then coming back toward me, but now if I'm Bob in my spaceship, I don't feel like I'm moving, I'm at rest in my spaceship, and I look out the window, and I see that the entire planet Earth is moving away from me and then coming back toward me. And that view is presumably perfectly legitimate, because we said everything is relative. So if Bob does the exact same calculation, he expects himself to age 10 years and Alice to age only eight years due to time dilation. In other words, each twin expects that they will be older than the other twin when they meet again. Obviously, they cannot both be right. They can't both be older than the other. And that is the paradox. So to resolve the paradox, we need to check if we made any wrong assumptions. Indeed, we secretly assumed that both Alice and Bob's frames are inertial, but that is not actually the case. So, okay, Alice stays on Earth, she doesn't do anything, so her frame is inertial. Now, Bob leaves Earth, travels to the other planet, and comes back to Earth, and during each leg of the trip, his frame is also inertial. Okay? He's moving at a constant speed of 60% of the speed of light to the planet, and then again moving at constant speed back to Earth. Remember, moving at constant speed, that is an inertial frame. But when Bob turns around, he is changing his velocity from 0.6, the speed of light, toward the planet, to 0.6, the speed of light, toward Earth. So there is a turnaround point. Bob is moving in this direction at constant speed, but he has to turn around and change his speed to the opposite direction. Changing speed is acceleration. So at that point in time, at the point where he is turning around, Bob is accelerating, so his frame is not inertial. Now, since Bob's frame is not inertial for the entire trip, I mean, it is inertial most of the trip, but it is not inertial at the point of turnaround, so it is not inertial for the entire trip, the symmetry is broken. We cannot just assume that Bob is at rest and Alice is moving, because at the moment of turnaround, Bob is not in an inertial frame, so he cannot possibly be at rest. If you're at rest, then that means you're in an inertial frame. If you're not in an inertial frame, that means you cannot be at rest. So in conclusion, there's no paradox. We will write the first time, and Alice will indeed be the older twin when they meet again. The symmetry has been broken. Bob cannot consider himself as the person who stays at rest, and Alice as the person who is moving, because he is, at one point during his trip, not in an inertial frame, which means he cannot consider himself as being at rest at that time, and therefore his calculation is incorrect. Okay, so I'm going to show you a video that provides a visual way to understand the twin paradox. Uh, this is one visual way to understand it. I'm actually going to show you a bit later a different way to understand it. So as you can see, in special relativity, weird things happen, but those weird things 
can be explained. Um, and in the case of a twin paradox, for example, there's many different ways to explain it. This is one way, using uh, by sending messages through light beams from one twin to the other. I'll show you another way in a bit. So now, while special relativity has weird consequences, it is indeed correct, and its effects have been uh, proven in many experiments. The reason we do not experience effects like time dilation in our daily lives is, like I said several times before, that we move much slower than light. So Newtonian mechanics is a good approximation to special relativity. Again, it's not precise. There's going to be a tiny little difference of maybe like one nanosecond, but that difference is not really measurable. It's not really significant. However, particle accelerators, such as the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, which I talked about uh, earlier this term, accelerate particles to relativistic speeds. In fact, to very, very close to the speed of light. So then time dilation inside particle accelerators is very significant. Special relativity correctly predicts the result of experiments in particle accelerators. If we tried to use Newtonian mechanics, we would get extremely incorrect predictions. So this is, of course, proof that Newtonian mechanics is incorrect. It doesn't apply in this case. And special relativity is correct because all its predictions are being verified by these experiments. Now, in 1977, physicists used muons, which are unstable subatomic particles that we learned about earlier, to prove that a clock that moves away and back to its initial position will measure less time than a clock that stayed at rest. So this both proved time dilation and also demonstrated the twin paradox, because this is essentially the twin paradox. There's one clock Bob, or Stella in, in the video. So Bob's clock is moving away and then back to its initial position. And then if you compare that clock to Alice's clock, you'll find that more time has passed on Alice's clock. So this is really experimental proof of what I just claimed about the twin paradox and time dilation. Now, length contraction was also proven in many experiments. For example, heavy ions, so remember an ion is an atom that had it, its electrons removed. In this case, all of the electrons are removed, so you have like a very heavy nucleus with lots of protons and neutrons, but no electrons. And these heavy ions are spherical when they are at rest. But when they move, they are length contracted along the direction of motion. So they take the shape of a flat disk. Okay, so it's a sphere, but it's moving very close to the speed of light. So for an observer at rest, it looks like the sphere is getting squashed into a disk. And again, you can observe this due to an increase in density. If the sphere gets squashed, then of course the density of the sphere increases. So Einstein's special theory of relativity, published in 1905, was a huge success. It unified Newtonian mechanics and electromagnetism and provided an accurate description of motion at relativistic speeds. However, special relativity did not incorporate gravity. In 1915, Einstein published his general theory of relativity. And as the name suggests, this theory generalized relativity to include gravity. And special relativity is, again, as the name suggests, a special case of general relativity, which applies when there is no gravity. Okay, so if you're dealing with some kind of 
system where gravity is not relevant, you can use special relativity, or at least when gravity is just very weak, so it doesn't matter much. But if you need to deal with gravity, as is usually the case in astronomy, when you want to deal with planets and stars and so on, uh, then you have to use general relativity, which of course is a more complicated theory. Now this is similar to how Newtonian mechanics is a special case of special relativity, which applies when speeds are slow compared to light. So we talked about this last time, when in our daily lives, we can use Newtonian mechanics, which is a very simple theory, because we're not moving close to the speed of light. But when things are moving close to the speed of light, or at least at a significant fraction of the speed of light, including, of course, light itself, then Newtonian mechanics isn't applicable anymore, and we have to use special relativity, a more complicated theory, but also a more precise theory. Now, an important principle in general relativity is the equivalence principle. Actually, we first learned about this in lecture 11. So let me remind you from that lecture that mass has two different meanings. The first meaning is resistance to acceleration by any force, and that is called inertial mass. So you're if your inertial mass is larger, that means you will move less when I push you with the same amount of force. And the second meaning of mass is the strength of the gravitational force, and that is called gravitational mass. So this type of mass tells me how much gravity you will exert on others and how much gravity you will uh, feel from others. Remember that in Newtonian gravity, the force of gravity is proportional to the product of the masses of the two objects. The equivalence principle says that these two types of mass are equivalent. That's why it's called the equivalence principle. So the inertial mass and gravitational mass of any object are always the same. So we can just call it mass. Okay, I don't have to say uh, this desk weighs 200 kilograms of inertial mass or gravitational mass, I can just say its mass is 200 kilograms. Now, the equivalence of inertial and gravitational mass is also known as the universality of free fall. And we already discussed this idea last term in lecture five, when we talked about Galileo. Galileo showed in an experiment that falling objects accelerate uniformly. All objects dropped in a gravitational field fall at the same rate, no matter what their mass is. And if you remember, this experiment was even done on the moon when an astronaut dropped a hammer and a feather and they both fell at the same speed, even though their mass is very different. If we did that experiment on Earth, then of course the feather would fall slowly because of air resistance. But if you do it in vacuum, when there's no air resistance, then both the feather and the hammer would fall at exactly the same rate. That is uh, what we call the universality of free fall. But this is only possible if inertial and gravitational mass are the same, so only if the equivalence principle is satisfied. Of course, we know from many different experiments that this is the case, therefore we know the, the equivalence principle is indeed satisfied. The formulation of the equivalence principle in terms of mass is called the weak equivalence principle, and sometimes it's abbreviated WEP. But the issue with the weak equivalence principle is that, unlike in Newtonian gravity, mass is actually not the only thing that affects gravity in general relativity. So remember, one consequence of special relativity, which we learned in previous lectures, 
is the relation E equals MC squared, the most famous equation of all times, basically, which tells us that mass is just a form of energy. If I have mass M, then you just multiply that by C squared to know how much energy that is equivalent to. So that means it, it's more precise to say that, at least in relativity, gravity is affected by energy, not mass. This is not the case in Newtonian gravity, but it is the case in general relativity, and indeed that is the case in reality. A better way to state the equivalence principle that doesn't use mass as part of the statement is the Einstein equivalence principle, or EEP. Now, the Einstein equivalence principle says that acceleration is locally indistinguishable from gravity. So imagine that you drop a ball in a small, sealed, and soundproof room with no windows. So here you are inside this soundproof room and there's no windows, you have no idea what's going on outside or where you are. Then you have no way to distinguish between the following two possibilities. So option one, this room is on the ground on Earth and the ball is falling due to gravity. Okay, here you are dropping the ball, the ball is falling to the ground, Everyone knows this, everyone has actually done this experiment many times in your life. But a second option is that this room is actually inside the rocket and it's far from any sources of gravity, so there's no gravity at all. This is just in outer space, far away from any stars or planets, no gravity at all, but this rocket is accelerating in space with the same acceleration as gravity on Earth, which is approximately 9.8 meters per second squared. In both cases, what will happen is exactly the same. So even if you're inside this rocket that is accelerating and you drop the ball, the ball is gonna to fall to the ground at exactly the same speed, exactly the same way, exactly the same direction as if you were on the surface of the Earth. And you have no way to distinguish between these two cases. Now, it's important to note two things about this experiment. So first of all, the equivalence principle says that acceleration is locally indistinguishable from gravity, and the word locally is important, because if the room was large enough, you could notice non-local, gravitational effects, such as tidal forces, or that gravity is weaker at higher altitudes. So if I had a large enough room, if this room was on the surface of the Earth, then on one side of, of the room, the direction of gravity would be different than on the other side, because gravity points to, toward the center of the Earth. The direction that we call down is actually the direction toward the center of the Earth, and if you have a large enough room, and I mean like a few hundred kilometers, let's say, then you will notice that the direction is definitely different in different places. Also, if this room was high, like it was tall enough, let's say a few kilometers or a few tens of kilometers tall, then you would notice that gravity is stronger when you are at a lower altitude and is weaker when you are at a higher altitude. And this comes from the uh, law of gravitation, which says that the force of gravity is proportional to one over the radius squared. So if the radius, if the distance from the center of the Earth increases, then the force of gravity decreases. So if, the, if this room was large enough, you could distinguish between being in a rocket or being on the surface of the Earth. But the point is that here, this room is small, and there's no way that you could ever notice any of these non-local effects. Now, the second point here, uh, the second important point to understand, is that this rocket needs to accelerate. If the rocket is just moving at a constant speed, 
then the ball will not drop, it will just float in the air. The same thing would happen if the room was in free fall toward Earth's surface. The ball would just float. So there's no way to distinguish between free fall in gravity and constant velocity without gravity. If the rocket is accelerating, that will feel like you are on the surface of the Earth and there is gravity. If the rocket is just moving at a constant speed, then you would not feel any gravity. You will just be floating in space. So here's a photo I showed you, I think I showed this to you last term. So these are astronauts on the International Space Station. And as you can see, they are floating in the air. Now they are actually well within the gravitational field of Earth. They do feel Earth's gravity, but they are in free fall. So they float in the air instead of falling down which I guess is kind of counterintuitive, but over the next few slides, I'm going to try to explain why that is the case. According to relativity, there is no such thing as absolute speed, because there's no way to detect what speed you're moving at. Any object moving at a constant speed and that includes zero speed. So if you're at rest, that's also a constant speed of zero. So any object moving at a constant speed is in an inertial frame, and physics in all inertial frames is the same according to the principle of relativity, which, as you remember from the previous lecture, is one of the two guiding principles of special relativity. So physics is the same in all inertial frames. However, in relativity, there is still absolute acceleration. This is because an accelerating object is in a non-inertial frame. You can detect that you're accelerating by, for example, dropping a ball, like in that experiment we just did. If it falls down, then you must be accelerating up. And this is a very important point to understand. Speed means nothing but acceleration is absolute. There's a difference between accelerating and not accelerating. To understand this better, think back on the twin paradox that we talked about last time. If Alice and Bob were both just moving at a constant speed relative to each other, then both would have aged the same. Now in that scenario, that's not what actually happens. Remember, Alice stayed on Earth and she aged more than Bob, who traveled on a rocket. But in the scenario where they both just move at constant speed relative to each other, there would have been a symmetry between Alice's and Bob's frames. Both are moving at constant speed relative to each other, and neither one is special. I can't say something like, okay, Alice is not moving, and Bob is moving. Because according to Alice, that is the case, but according to Bob, he is not moving, and Alice is the one who is moving, and neither one of them is more correct than the other. It's all just relative, hence the name relativity. However, what actually happens is that Bob must accelerate to turn back, which breaks the symmetry. Acceleration, like I said, is absolute. So we can't say that both Alice and Bob are accelerating relative to each other. That doesn't make sense. Bob is actually special because he is only, the only one accelerating. Okay, I can say that Alice is at rest and Bob is moving, or Bob is at rest and Alice is moving. That is fine as long as neither of them is accelerating. But if one of them is accelerating, then Bob is accelerating and Alice is not accelerating. There's just no other way to describe that scenario. So acceleration is not relative. It doesn't depend on the observer. You can either accelerate or not accelerate. From the equivalence principle, Einstein deduced that free fall is actually a type of inertial motion. <laughs> 
So let's compare the old ideas and the new ideas. So in the old theory, in Newtonian mechanics, when you're falling, the force of gravity accelerates you, so you are in a non-inertial frame. Remember, an inertial frame is one that is not accelerated, so if the force of gravity is accelerating you downward, then you are in a non-inertial frame, according to Newtonian mechanics. And when you're on the ground, the force of gravity cancels with the normal force of the ground pushing up on you, so you're in an inertial frame. Okay, who here has seen this before, like in high school physics, when you draw a force diagram? Okay, a few people. So, you know, you can either have a force pointing down, in which case there is acceleration, or you can have the gravity force down, but then the normal force up, and they both cancel each other, so there's no total force. Therefore, there's also no acceleration, and when you stand on the ground, you are in an inertial frame. That is what you learned in high school, but that is actually not true. Because according to the equivalence principle, which we know is true because we have done many experiments to confirm it, the opposite is actually true. When you're falling, it's just like floating in space at constant speed, so you're in an inertial frame, and when you're on the ground, it's just like being accelerated by a rocket in space, far from any gravitational fields, so you are in a non-inertial frame. Okay, it's exactly the opposite as what Newtonian mechanics says. Right now, all of you are sitting on a chair, and according to Newtonian mechanics, you would be in an inertial frame, but according to the equivalence principle, you are actually in a non-inertial frame. What we learn from this, and what Einstein concluded from this, is that gravity is not a force. So from, from Newton's second law, we know that force is proportional to acceleration. If you remember, F equals ma, where F is the force, A is the acceleration, m is the mass. When you're falling, no force acts on you, because gravity is not a force, so you're not being accelerated, and you are in an inertial frame. Now it looks to you like you're accelerating down, but actually everything else is accelerating up. And I can say this because remember, acceleration is absolute. So there's, there's no such thing as relative acceleration. It can't be that either you're accelerating down and everyone else is at rest, or you're at rest and every, everyone else is accelerating up. There's no such thing. Acceleration is absolute, so you can either be accelerating or not be accelerating. And in, the truth is that when you're falling down, when you're in free fall, you are in an inertial frame and everything else is accelerating up. When you're on the ground, the normal force pushes up on you, so you are being accelerated and you are in a non-inertial frame. Yeah, this force that pushes up on you doesn't get cancelled with any other force because gravity is not a force. So you are in a non-inertial frame, and again, it looks to you when you're standing on the ground like you're not accelerating, but actually you are accelerating up. And again, I can say this because there's a a physical difference between you accelerating and not accelerating that is not the case regarding if you're moving at a constant velocity or not moving at a constant velocity. So you can say with certainty that you are not accelerating and there's no frame, uh, there's no inertial frame where you are accelerating. Okay, so now you might say, but how can everything on the ground be accelerating up all the time relative to an inertial frame and yet stay at the same place? And the answer to that, and this is the most profound discovery due to the equivalence principle, is that space-time must be curved. When things are in free fall, 
they follow paths in space-time called geodesics. Now in geometry, just in normal geometry, not space-time geometry, geodesics are the shortest paths. Geodesic on a flat surface will just be a straight line, but the geodesic on a curved surface, like a sphere, will be a curved line. Now, the geometry of space-time is more complicated. A geodesic in space-time is not actually the shortest path, but it is, in a sense, the easiest path to take in a curved space-time. So nature is lazy, basically. Nature always takes the easiest path, and in a curved space-time, the easiest path to take is the geodesic. Due to the curvature of the Earth, your geodesic wants to take you down all the way toward the center of the planet. However, you are clearly, right now, not falling toward the center of the Earth. That's because the ground, or in the case of students in this classroom, the chair, is in your way. Okay, you can't fall through the chair. The ground or the chair is applying a normal force that is pushing you up to resist you from being pushed down toward the center of the Earth. This is the only force acting on you, since, again, gravity is not a force. Now, force equals acceleration, so you're being accelerated upward by the chair that you're sitting on. This means that you are currently not following a geodesic. Therefore, you are not in free fall, since if you were, you would have been following a geodesic. And since free fall equals inertial frame, that means you are in a non-inertial frame. So in other words, in a curved space-time, you must move to stay in place. If the chair wasn't accelerating you up, then you would have actually been drawn toward the center of the Earth. Then it, the only reason you are staying in place right now is that the chair is accelerating you up to resist you from, to prevent you from moving along your geodesic. All right, so in this bonus video, Derek Mueller from the YouTube channel Veritasium explains the equivalence principle, why gravity is not a force, and the role of acceleration and geodesics in general relativity, basically all the stuff I just talked about. However, he has cooler animations, so I recommend that you watch this video. However, it's, I think it's like 20 minutes, so I'm not gonna show it to you in class, but I highly recommend that you watch this in your own time. Okay, so in 1907, Based on the equivalence principle, Einstein predicted an effect called gravitational redshift. According to this prediction, the wavelength of photons redshifts, which let me remind you, it means shifts towards longer wavelengths because red has a longer wavelength than blue. So the wavelength of photons shifts towards longer wavelengths or redshifts as they travel away from a source of gravity. Conversely, the wavelength of photons blue shifts, which means shifts towards shorter wavelengths as they travel toward a source of gravity. Now, while this is usually presented as a consequence of general relativity, in fact, only the equivalence principle itself is needed to derive it. And indeed, Einstein predicted the gravitational redshift in 1907, which was eight years before publishing general relativity in 1915. So even without the full theory of general relativity, just with the equivalence principle, it's already enough to derive this effect. Now to see how gravitational redshift arises from the equivalence principle, Consider a lab inside an accelerating rocket, like we talked about before. So instead of a room, let's say, instead of just you dropping a ball, maybe there's like a more uh, full-featured lab inside this rocket. Now light is emitted upwards from the floor of the lab toward a detector on the, the ceiling. Okay, so 
you can imagine my laser as being that light. So this light is emitted from the floor, and there's a detector up there in the ceiling that is detecting that light. But according to a free-falling or inertial observer, remember free-falling is the same as inertial according to the equivalence principle. So according to a free-falling observer, by the time the light reaches the ceiling, the ceiling has already accelerated away from it because the rocket is accelerating. Now, according to the Doppler effect, which we talked about back in lecture 12, since the detector is moving away from the source of light, it will detect the light as being redshifted. Remember that according to the Doppler effect, if a star is moving away from us, or we're moving away from the star, then the light from the star will shift toward the red. The same thing happens here. Because the ceiling is moving away from the light as it escapes the floor toward the ceiling, then there will be a redshift according to the Doppler effect. We know that in this lab experiment in the accelerating rocket, there will be a redshift. Now, by the equivalence principle, physics inside an accelerating rocket is indistinguishable from physics in a gravitational field. Okay, this is the same thing we talked about when you dropped the ball. You don't know whether you are inside an accelerating rocket or on the surface of Earth feeling gravity. Therefore, if we repeat this experiment in a lab located on the surface of the Earth, we will observe the same redshift. In other words, when light moves away from the Earth or any other source of gravity, it will be redshifted. Now, this may seem weird, like many other effects in relativity, but gravitational redshift has been demonstrated experimentally many times in the form of shifts in the spectral lines of the sun, white dwarfs, and even stars passing new supermassive black holes. So if you remember from the previous lectures that there are these spectral lines, and by observing them shifting, we know if the star is moving away or toward us, and we also know what speed it's moving at. But there's this additional shift due to gravitational redshift, and we can detect that on top of any other kind of shift. Now, a related effect is gravitational time dilation. This is a separate effect from special relativistic time dilation, also known as kinematic time dilation, which we discussed earlier. So remember that kinematic time dilation basically says that different observers moving at constant velocity relative to each other will experience time differently, or they will see time from a different perspective, essentially. Now, gravitational time dilation predicts that clocks run slower if they are closer to a source of gravity. For example, a clock on Earth at sea level will run slower than a clock on the top of Mount Everest. Now, to see how this follows from gravitational redshift, recall that the wavelength of light is inversely proportional to its frequency, as we learned in previous lectures. So imagine a clock on Earth emitting light at a constant frequency as measured by the clock itself. So for example, it can emit light at one hertz, which would be radio waves, um, one wavelength per second. So the clock measures a second and it emits light according to the second it, seconds it measures. An observer at a fixed altitude in space then detects the light. Now the closer the clock is to the source of gravity, the more redshifted the light will be according to the observer. But when light is redshifted, its wavelength gets longer, and because wavelength is inversely proportional to frequency, this means that its frequency becomes slower. 
So the observer in space will see the clock tick at slower and slower frequencies the closer the clock is to the surface of the Earth. Now, as with all the other effects we talked about, gravitational time dilation has been proven in many experiments. For example, in the Huffle Keating experiment in 1971, atomic clocks, so very precise clocks, were flown on planes and compelled to clocks that stayed on the ground. The readings on the clocks differed in exactly the way that relativity predicts. So this includes both kinematic time dilation due to differences in velocity, as we learned last time, and gravitational time dilation due to differences in height between the ground and the planes. Now, in this experiment, the clocks differed by only a few nanoseconds. Of course, this isn't a very strong effect because Remember, in our daily lives, obviously, we don't feel this gravitational time dilation. So there is, if you fly on a plane, you may actually be older by a few nanoseconds than someone who stayed on the ground, but this is not something you will ever notice. You could theoretically age slower if you lived at a lower altitude on Earth, but not by any significant amount. However, the difference can hypothetically become significant in an extremely strong gravitational field, such as near a black hole. This was demonstrated in the movie Interstellar in 2014, where the characters stayed, I think, for one hour on a planet that was orbiting a supermassive black hole. And when they came back, they found out that 23 years have passed for everyone else. So they experienced very significant gravitational time dilation due to this very strong gravitational field. There's just one thing to note about this movie. If you ever watch it, the first half of this movie is scientifically accurate. In fact, it is remarkably accurate with uh, stuff like, you know, the black hole looks realistic, gravitational time dilation is realistic and everything else. But then the second half of the movie is complete nonsense, and not scientifically accurate at all, so just so that you're aware. Now, interestingly, the global positioning system, or GPS, that we use on a daily basis also serves as concrete proof of gravitational time dilation. This system consists of many satellites of course, orbiting the Earth, carrying atomic clocks, which broadcast their position and the time on their clocks continuously. And then a receiver on the ground can compare the data from several different satellites to calculate its position accurately. However, the GPS satellites are at a higher altitude, so the clocks run faster than clocks on Earth due to gravitational time dilation. So without correcting for gravitational time dilation, the GPS that we all use on our phones would not have worked. So in a sense, every time you use GPS, you basically make a test of general relativity. And if it predicts your position correctly, that means general relativity is correct because it relies on general relativity and gravitational time dilation to give this accurate uh, position. Next, I want to talk about the perihelion precession of Mercury. So according to Kepler's first law, if you remember from last term, a planet orbits the sun in an ellipse with the sun at one of the foci of the ellipse. This law can be derived from Newtonian physics, which also predicts that the elliptical orbit itself remains fixed, at least if we have just one planet. Now, the perihelion is the point where the planet is closest to the sun. And if there's more than one planet, as is the case in the solar system, then Newtonian physics predicts that the elliptical orbit will undergo perihelion precession meaning that the perihelion point, 
and therefore the orbit itself will rotate around the sun. So here's an animation. So this was the original orbit, and you can see that the orbit itself, so of course the planet is moving along the orbit, but also the orbit itself is slowly rotating around the sun. The perihelion is this point, and this point, the point where the sun is closest to the planet, this point basically moves around. Okay, so now the perihelion is here, and the perihelion slowly precesses. Or it's just easier to see that the entire orbit basically rotates around the sun. Now, in our solar system, the only planet that undergoes significant perihelion precession is Mercury. That's because it is the closest to the sun. Now, in 1859, it was shown that the precession of Mercury doesn't match the Newtonian prediction. So at first, astronomers thought this might be due to an undiscovered planet between the Sun and Mercury, which was named Vulcan, hypothetically. Now, this was actually motivated by the fact that Neptune was previously found based on anomalies in the orbit of Uranus. So if you remember, last term in Lecture 10, I talked about this. So the orbit of Uranus wasn't exactly as Newtonian physics predicted, and astronomers deduced there has to be another planet beyond Uranus, and that's how they, find, they found Neptune. So maybe there is another planet named Vulcan between the Sun and Mercury, and that is affecting the per perihelion precession of Mercury. However, Despite extensive searches, this planet was not found. Now, the true reason for the anomalous precession of Mercury was only found in 1915, when Einstein published his general theory of relativity. Einstein showed that his theory correctly predicted the perihelion precession of Mercury. So, in addition, to the Newtonian sources of precession, the curvature of space-time introduces additional precession that Newton's theory doesn't account for because in Newtonian gravity, space-time is not curved. Now, this was a very significant discovery, solving a long-standing problem in astronomy. Therefore, it helped motivate physicists and astronomers to adopt general relativity as a more precise theory of gravity. So today we know that general relativity provides the most precise description of gravity, as far as we know, and Newtonian gravity only applies in the Newtonian limit when these three conditions are satisfied, so particles move slowly compared to light, which remember, this is also the case where special relativity reduces to Newtonian mechanics, and gravity is weak, so we're not around some black hole or something that has very strong gravity, and the gravitational field is static, so it doesn't change with time. So basically, if you're talking about a star, that star just stays exactly the same for forever. In that case, the Newtonian limit applies. Of course, these conditions are only satisfied in very specific cases. So usually, none of these conditions would be satisfied. Therefore, general relativity is the theory that we used uh, that we use when we want to talk about gravity in the most precise way. Next, I want to talk about deflection of light by the sun. So it was already known in 1801 that Newtonian gravity predicts that light will bend around a massive object. This means that light from stars will be deflected by the sun. Now, general relativity also predicts that light will be bent by the sun. The sun curves space-time, 
and light follows geodesics, and in a curved space-time, geodesics are not straight lines. Therefore, the paths of light would be bent. So Einstein calculated that light will be deflected by approximately 1.75 arc seconds as it passes near the sun. And this was double the value predicted by Newtonian gravity. This prediction was tested in 1919 in the Eddington experiment, which was organized by Arthur Eddington and Frank Dyson. Normally, we can't see light from the stars being deflected by the sun, because when the sun is in the sky, then we can't see the stars. However, on May 29, 1919, there was a total solar eclipse. Remember that a, to a total solar eclipse is when the moon is exactly between us and the sun and is blocking the light from the sun. So at that time, the sun's light was momentarily blocked and stars near the sun could be observed. These observations were performed in two places on the path of the eclipse, a town in Brazil and an island near the west coast of Africa. And when I say the path of the eclipse, again, we talked about this last term, but uh, the moon casts a shadow on the surface of the Earth. But this shadow doesn't cover the entire planet. This shadow covers just a specific region. And as the moon and the Earth move, this shadow moves. So basically, these two places were inside the shadow of the moon. While other places, like in Canada, for example, you wouldn't be able to see the eclipse or you would only see a partial eclipse. Now, photos were taken of the stars near the sun and compared with photos of the same stars taken earlier during nighttime. So at that time, of course, the stars were visible, but the sun was not in the sky, therefore the light from those stars was not deflected from the sun in these earlier photos. Now, the Eddington experiment showed that the deflection of the stars indeed matches Einstein's predictions and not the predictions of Newtonian gravity. Okay, so basically they compared the positions of the stars without the sun and with the sun, and they found they were deflected by a certain amount when the sun was in, in the path of the light, and that confirmed Einstein's prediction. Now, this was such a significant scientific discovery that it made the front page of most major newspapers, and Einstein became famous around the world. Today, I think, he is probably one of the most famous physicists that ever lived, and it was partially due to this huge experimental success of his theory of general relativity, which, as you've seen, has many unintuitive consequences, and I will talk more about how it basically completely revolutionized astronomy in the next lecture. The results of the Eddington experiment, however, were not very precise. So, you know, maybe they made some mistake, but similar experiments have been performed several times since then with better equipment, so better precision, and the results, again, closely matched Einstein's prediction. In 2017, the deflection of light was shown for the first time using a star other than the sun. So they used the nearby white dwarf, it's called Stein 2051b. It's located about 18 light years from Earth, so that is relatively close. When the white dwarf passed in front of a more distant star, light from that star was deflected. And in fact, this was used to measure the white dwarf's mass, since the amount of deflection depends on the mass. So again, this was proof of Einstein's theory more than 100 years after he published it in a different way that was done before. Yeah, so here we have a video that summarizes the Eddington experiment.